strange to welcome you because I'm welcoming you to your own city and so on. But welcome, very Thank good you. to uh, meet you, uh, Robert, finally. So um, what I'd like to do in this interview, I'd like to start a bit with your childhood, which sounds a bit psychoanalytical. Um, I wanted to say a bit about the world you grew up in and your parents. Um, I would, I'm aware you were, you were brought up in um, Coffs Harbour, um, and I was very struck by this lovely poem. Hi there, come in, come in. There's, there's this really. I was very struck by a lovely poem called Diptych about your mother and father. I thought you, it might be a good way of sort of introducing you to people if we can hear a bit about the world you, came, you come from, the, your parents and so on. I come from a very disparate background. My father was from a well-to-do family but a hopeless drunkard. And my mother was a farm girl who stuck by him because she was very religious. So they were a mismatched couple, always at odds. And my father fascinates me because he was so much in love with words. Mm. And he would make puns and jokes and plays on words constantly. And uh, my mother was not an intellectual or any, any sort of uh, educated person. But she had a wonderful warmth and she was a person who um, was very loyal. So she stayed with him, but got Protestant religion, which was the big problem that I had to break away from. Um, my father was known in the town for having driven his car off a mountainside in the, in the banana growing district and careering down the hillside, knocking down the banana palms of someone's plantation, the car being piled underneath with these sap oozing fibrous banana trees until the tr it was reared up at a steep angle and it arrived at the back door of a woman who was uh, <laughs> alone that evening with her baby. And my father managed to struggle down out of the car and doff his hat to her. <laughs> and never dry, drove again. <laughs> so he had a horse which used, used to take him home drunk on, on its back. And uh, people would arrive with uh, items that he'd, he'd divested along the way, his jacket, <laughs> his, uh, his uh, books, his newspapers, his, his business papers. The workman on the road would come to my mother and say, this your old man's missus? And <laughs> return what he'd lost in, in his effort to get home. The, the horse used to come up the hill and go to the front door and bump on it with its nose. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be dragged down from it by my mother and helped inside. But um, I left school, left home early and went to Sydney and became a journalist. Oh, I did a cadetship, but uh, <coughs> I saw that I was never going to get very far that way, so I uh, took to advertising, writing advertising copy and uh, made some money, uh, got married, paid my wife what money I had earned, saved and went to work at the mail exchange sorting letters and then uh, what happened next? I became a, the buyer in a bookshop. I think I recognised some of you from my, as customers of mine at the New Edition bookshop where I worked for I think 18 years part time mm. and able to buy the books for the shop and anything that I needed for myself at cost price. So I got an education that way. <laughs> and. Uh, the man who employed me didn't, didn't read, so I had a free hand and uh, he, he was actually the, the son of Lady Gregory's daughter. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeats had a patron, the, the Irish poet Yeats had a patron called Lady Gregory who had a vast property in Ireland and her, this woman, Lady Gregory, had a, a daughter whose husband was assassinated at the final ceremony of the departure from Italy after the Second World War. And uh, 
her son, who was never to see his father, was the man who owned the bookshop. And so I was patronised by the Gregory family, like Yates. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, carrying on about the bookshop, um, I'm, I'm wondering when, when, po when writing and first came to your life, in, in one of your poems, Curriculum Vitae, you say, um, you talk about seeing a, a swallow racing as fast as a ball. A cricket ball. A cricket ball, and you said, it was decided for me within that instant where my interests lay. I wonder whether you could say something about how poetry entered your life, both reading it and writing it. Uh, well, it's just a natural proclivity, something that, that I can do to some extent, which um, I, I think that uh, there's no explanation for why it arises. It's just mm. some people have this affliction. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I was just able... I was just always attracted to imagery and poetry and evocation and description and the, the use of language so that these little black ants on the page summon up a world of light and, and marvellous world of nature. That these black ants can do that to us has always fascinated me. And I'm, I'm interested in um, uh, the visual world. I've always been really fascinated by the natural world, just the look of it. And uh, so it was, uh, someone once said, whatever else he can't do, he was meant to be a poet. And <laughs> I was unable to do anything else. I just knew from when I first encountered poetry at school that, that I would be... Uh, uh, interested in it, you know, fo follow it uh, devotedly. My father knew lots of poems and he was always quoting. And he claimed to be descended from Thomas Gray, the elegy in a country churchyard, mm -hmm. who had no children. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't a good candidate for an ancestor. <laughs> and did you start writing poems yourself early as a child or yes mm. yes no. I, I read emily dickinson for my i discovered her for myself and i was so struck by her language that uh, i wanted to do something like it uh, emily dickinson's poems are naive and they suit a young person starting out to write um, they they're almost like poems for children but they have an extraordinary invention in the language. There's one that I'm fond of which begins, I, I started early, took my dog and visited the sea. The mermaids in the basement came out to look at me. And I thought the mermaids in the basement, how inventive, you know, mm. how extraordinary. Mm. Mm. And of course, I, you know, reading uh, Cumulus, I wanted to ask about the influence of Buddhism on your life and poems. Yeah, you were a writer in, uh, in residence of major university in Tokyo. Your poetry has been clearly influenced by Chinese and Japanese poetry. Like One of the things I keep noticing reading Cumulus is the haiku-like form that you use, often things like 12 poems or yes. six poems, you know, these beautiful, short, very, very um, vivid poems. Then there's that long poem, Dharma Vehicle, um, which a friend first pointed me out to, uh, pointed out to me, and you described yourself as a Buddhist heretic, of all things. Um, you put like I was the other thing I was thinking of your poem "Smoke" is like a, a Buddhist meditation on change and mutability. There's Buddhism in many of the poems that yeah. don't mention mm. the subject, but I was first attracted to Buddhism through the aesthetics of the poetry. I was mainly interested in the poetry, in the haiku poetry and the, the vivid imagery of the haiku. And the only after that became interested in the, the philosophy behind it that had made this uh, form of poetry possible. So, um, mm. And then I went to Japan and uh, didn't like it very much. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, I was disappointed because I had an ideal in my mind of what mm. Japan and China would be like. Mm. 
Arthur Whaley, the great translator of Chinese poetry, said that he would never go to China because he would be so disappointed in the difference between what the ideal world in his poems and mm. the, and the, uh, the world of actuality. Mm. But um, I became, I read a book which I recommend if it's still in print called The Way of Zen by, Arthur, by uh, Alan Watts. Mm. And I think that's what influenced me. Mm. Mm. I found it in a country town. This shows how the world's declined. I found that book in a country town in a wire stand that revolved by pushing it in, the, in a newsagent mm. amongst lots of other dusty, fly-blown books. Mm. And uh, you wouldn't, wouldn't find a mm. book like that in a news agency in the country now. Mm. So uh, I was uh, very taken with, with the idea of Zen aesthetics. I like polished floorboards and a single flower in a vase and the tea ceremony and <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, the aesthetics of it, I mm. like, and the, the vividness of the poetry. But why you also say that you, you stayed at the Zen Centre at one point, at the San Francisco? Then? I lived in the Zen Centre in San Francisco for a year, studying Soto Zen, the meditation school. And uh, Gary Snyder was there. Have you heard of Gary Snyder? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a very famous beatnik. Yeah. <laughs> quite, quite a few others yeah. came through. Yeah. And... Uh, I was attached to a teacher in Japan mm. for a while. Mm. So uh, I have some credentials as a meditator. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to uh, turn more now to, to the poems, particularly in humorous, which I've been reading. Um, I mean, one of the things I find really, you know, I discovered um, uh, Robert's poems by uh, looking at an anthology in England, and they, they reproduced two of uh, Robert's poems, and I was really, really struck by them, and I rushed out and bought the only copy I could find in England. And one of the things that excited me very much about the poems is they seemed to me to be the sort of English romantic tradition from Wordsworth and Keats and so on, transplanted into Australian soil and completely naturalised in that landscape. Yeah. There's a sense in which your vision of uh, the Australian landscape has got, it, 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 it's a fully um, transcribed romanticism, if you mean, that um, something, a, a sort of tradition in poetry which I, I love very much. I suddenly see it taking a rebirth, as it were. Mm. Um, that's what re I got very, very excited about that, that you'd made Australia a place of poetry in the same way that Wordsworth made the Lake District a place of poetry or... Healy has made Ireland a place of poetry. We've got quite a few good poets in this country. Yes, I'm... I'm afraid... It may just be by ignorance, but... Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite right. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, oh, yes, I was... You know, like, I, was, I remember reading your poem, uh, Kangaroo. Oh, yes. And, you know, it's incredible. I don't know if anyone's read that poem. It's an incredibly vivid... Uh, moment in a way uh, described. Uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to be staying with a friend of mine in Bondi, and there, there you are in the connection with a poem called Bondi, a yeah. wonderful poem. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about uh, your particular sort of sense of landscape. Um, I mean, in, in, there's incredible descriptions of landscape throughout the poems, particularly of the sea, which seems to come back and back to you as a haunting. Um, uh, refrain, but also the rain seems to be almost a muse to you. Yeah. Uh, the rain, descriptions of rain, the sound of rain, the look of rain. The poetry is about evoking the, the world. It's about um, being more aware of the world by watching for the poetic subject to come up, uh, for the haiku to arrive. Um, hi, hi, writing haiku, short images poems, is, is a discipline in seeing. It makes you constantly alert and aware to, to the world. And I'm just naturally a person who is attracted to the look of the world. Uh, and the philosophical poems are explanations of why mm. the, this 
world sh should be uh, paid attention to. Mm. I think uh, I've expanded on bu bu my Buddhist interests mm. and I'm interested in pre-Socratic Greek philosophers like Heraclitus and, mm. and Aristotle and people and I've tried to find in my poetry the, we the Western equivalent of the Oriental forms that I was first attracted to. I've tried to make uh, Australian poetry uh, make it sort of um, sophisticated, I suppose is the word, mm. Phil philosophically. Mm. There's a strong uh, philosophical yeah, tone throughout the poem. Yes, and it's all explaining. The, the, uh, what I'm interested in is that the world should be seen as real, that, it, that the world is not an illusion. It's, I believe that we, we see the real world and I wanted to explain how it is that we see the real world, how, how it is that this world is the ultimate world. The commonplace world that we know is the ultimate world. Mm. It's, it's, uh, and I was, uh, found it very appealing the philosophy of the Buddhist master Dogen, who was a realist about the world and who uh, saw the great mystery of life. There's, the, the mystery of life is that uh, th things exist, that something exists. And how, how can we grasp this existence, this thing that exists? What is existence? How can we feel the reality of existence? That's what I was interested in writing about. And, and being, being moved by the world as, uh, as it impinges on us. I, I wanted to um, have nothing between me and the world. No, no. I wanted a philosophy that would remove philosophy from mm. the way I saw the world. Mm. And I wanted to know why I was so exhilarated by the look of things and by their actual tangible existence. Mm. Their, their, Things as as they are, were what I wanted to capture. Mm. It, I don't know if that's making any sense. But, mm. Mm. Uh, well, I was thinking that the poems are both rapturous and exact. Yes. I was thinking that a poem, for instance, like uh, "Rainy Windows," yes. manages this to be both rapturous and almost ecstatic, but also exact. Yes. Yes. Very difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I see myself as just an ordinary person. <laughs> How did I write this stuff? <laughs> but I think it makes um, people, people who read the poems more intensely uh, perceptive. Mm. That's what I want to do, make, mm. make us see. The, the world is a series of things transforming one into another. and. We, we can't grasp what that substance is that is being transformed, but, uh, but we can feel it. Um, it's very hard to explain, uh, and yet it, it should be simple. It, mm. it should be possible to say, I, I know how to do it. Ar Aristotle says that uh, the, the, the world, the substance of the world, is something that can never be grasped in itself because it changes all the time. And we, we, can't, we can't pin it down, we can't hold it. But there is a substance to the world nevertheless, which is uh, what we experience every day. Mm. And we don't realise the marvellous quality of it in, in our daily lives. Uh, so um, I've just tried to capture that mm. mysterious substance. The, mm. In Buddhism it's called the void. Mm. And in Aristotle, whom I think had the same idea as the, mm. as the Zen Buddhist, mm. it's, it's called uh, the unbounded. The, the nature of the, the world is unbounded, un, mm. un, 
unrestricted and it's it's um it's something that I feel all the time and try to put into into words. Mm. Sorry to labour the point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the other thing that strikes me is that um, y y your writing gives us so much to enjoy. One of the things yeah. I, re re I mean, I've been rereading the poems, and um, <coughs> that you know, a good, a really good poet will sort of describe things in such a way is that you enjoy the world more deeply. Yes, that's um, that's the real point of it. To That's, relish the world, to yeah, relish life. Yeah. Well, you're not a. I was struck by that you're not a. You're not a poet who talks about poetry. If you mean you're a, no. a poet trying to talk about life and yes. getting us closer to life. That's right. That's how I've been seeing it. Um, You've been doing right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, you seem to be trying to use words in the most exact way so that we actually see things better. Yes, that's um, exactly right. See things afresh, but see things more vividly. As I try to see what the substance of the world is, this substance that the Buddhists say is void, you know, it, it transforms itself into other things constantly, um, but, but it exists underneath all this, this change. It's not something that remains the same, it changes. The substance of the world is changing all the time and we, we can't grasp what it is because it's only what it is at the moment mm. and uh, so anyway enough of that. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to was thinking about your poems was that the, the poetry is very visual. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes in poems like Sailing on the Hawkesbury River for instance you it's as if you want to say description is enough. You yeah. manage to make description, the whole poem, quite often. Yes. It's very, very difficult to do. I don't know whether anyone's ever written a poem, but it's very, very difficult to pull off a poem which is just primarily description because it so easily just looks like there's this and there's that and that. But some, quite often in your poems, there's this incredible description which is so heightened that it stands as a poem on its own. Yes, that's exactly what I wanted. Um, I wanted to make the thing you described the, of ultimate importance. Mm. And, and the meaning of life is, is in apprehending these transitory things. They're, they're what, they are what is ultimately of value. Mm. And you use sim you're well known for using simile a lot yes. in your attempt to push language towards how things are. In. An academic once put into the computer my poems and picked out how many times like had been used. Oh really? And it was, I hate to think, it was thousands of times. Right. <laughs> but I said Rilke used it more. Right. <laughs> Rilke uses like and, yeah, yeah. and as and very, very much. Mm. I'm very keen on Rilke's poem. Mm. 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 I mean, the other question I wanted to ask, which is that one of the themes seems to me, and you, you've touched on it already, is the, the great theme of change. Yes. Um, That's the fundamental idea in Buddhism, I think, that things are transformed, are fluxive, changing all the time. Mm, mm. And yet something persists. Amongst all this change, something persists. And it doesn't, it's not unchanging. Something that was unchanging would be nothing. It would be, there wouldn't be any way of, of apprehending it. It would just be nothing, but something that's changing all the time is uh, uh, rich and mm. plural and fascinating. Mm. Mm. You know, that, that, uh, there's this like, lovely sad poem of beauty and passing, a, a summer's evening, for instance, which oh, yes. uh, really struck me. Then there's a be this beautiful, sad, again, very, sa very sad poem about your mother called In Departing Light, which I was... Oh, yeah reading again just this morning in this cafe in wherever I was, Byron, Byron? Oh, Rossi, oh, Silver, <laughs> Shakespeare, Dickens. Um, I, wonder, I wonder whether you say something about that poem. I was very, I mean, the, the, there's an incredible description of your mother and then it's very sad saying for her, for saying that she's more peaceful now than she was when she was. Mm. I think that, um, I think Buddhism is pessimistic. I think it realises the sadness of life and it doesn't try to run away from that. 
it, it maintains the contact with uh, the fact that life is disappointing and uh, destructive and we, we lose all that we value. And traditional Theravada Buddhism is trying to make oneself as small a target as possible through the misfortunes of life. That, <laughs> Going to get, going to get us. And uh, I, I think uh, that uh, it's important to accept that life is dissatisfying, as the, as the Buddha said. And uh, so I wrote a poem about my mother who had a very sad life, and didn't try to promise her anything that she wouldn't experience. I, I accepted her, her death and her, pa her passing away into nothingness and with all her dissatisfactions and that's what the poem's about. Mm -hmm. But again, this is lo lovely, it's a very warm poem as well, isn't it? It's a yeah, very tender I, poem. I think it's important that poetry have a humane warmth about it. We, um, we are so isolated one from another that if we can make contact with other people it's very important and so I've uh, I've tried to uh, what fiction and poetry are about are ways of consoling us to to life to bring consolation into our lives and uh, I, I've tried to do that Mm. Make, mm. make it consol con consolation. Mm. Van Gogh said in the paintings, the terrible, in, in the proper sense of the word, terrible pa paintings that he produced, those terrifying paintings, he said that what art is about is, is consoling people, giving them some consolation. So he tried to paint nature as a consolation. Mm. And, uh, and often fail. But, but I'm I'm trying to give consolation through mm. through this awareness of of nature. You can be at the sink in the morning when the light comes in, and you can be making a cup of tea, and suddenly you feel the wonderful warmth of the sun and the and the vividness of the day, and that momentary awareness is something that I try to capture to show people where they'll find consolation. They find consolation in ordinary things. Uh, and even someone, a woman who's lost her child, is, div is stricken with, with agony, can, because life is changing all the time, can have moments of consolation from the natural world. She can look out and the birds can be singing and the breeze blowing and she can experience a, a momentary consolation and the next moment she might be plunged back into despair. But then, such is the nature of life, she rises into an appreciation of life again the next moment. So we, when we're sad, we shouldn't cling to the fact that we're sad. We should allow that this changes, this, that the world is releasing us from our sadness all the time with, uh, with the, the next moment. So the, the fundamental idea in Buddhism, as I see it, is that things are changing constantly and that changing nature of the reality releases us. If we don't cling to the fact, I am sad, I have been mistreated by life, you know, so, but just look to the passing of the moment as a, as a form of release. Mm. Has that been, that's the experience I have of meditation. Uh, that Dogen, who taught meditation as the only me method of salvation, s said that um, uh, we were released by uh, just sitting facing the wall and f thoughts arise and they pass. 
and that is the nature, that is uh, practice as enlightenment. Practice is already enlightenment. If we're sitting in a, in a state where we let everything go and pass, we're experiencing a lot enlightenment. And uh, we, there can be terrible feelings coming into our mind, but if we let, don't hold them, then we're in a state of enlightenment. So uh, that's what I try to do, to uh, show that the world is very various and that the justification of life is that it's so various. That's the only good thing you can say for life. <laughs> it's very various. <laughs> All sorts of things happen. <laughs> Sorry, this sounds like a sermon. <laughs> I want to ask you just one, other, one or two other things. And one, one of the things that struck, struck me again reading, rereading Cumulus was you know, about half, not quite halfway through the book, suddenly rhyme appears. Yeah. You know, having written in, you know, you, you, just when I started to think I'm you know, a particular kind of free verse poet, suddenly rhyme yeah. appears, full rhyme even. Yeah. You say something about why in that movement into rhyme. I think you sort of moved back a, a, away from rhyme again, but. Uh. I, I've always liked rhyme in poetry, but it was pro proscribed by the literary critics. The same as drawing wasn't allowed in painting, you know, mm. you, they gave away drawing. But I've always loved poems that rhyme, and I thought, why shouldn't I just make them rhyme, because I, I enjoy it. Mm. Uh, I like part, half rhymes. Emily Dickinson has a, a poem which says, Ample make this bed, make this bed with awe. In it wait till judgment break, excellent and fair. Awe and fair don't mm. rhyme. They, they, they just echo, they chime, they mm. glance against each other. And yet that seems to me really beautiful. Mm. I, the one good thing Oscar Wilde had to say for Bosie, his boyfriend who got him sent to prison, was that... Uh, when he rhymed, and the rhymes were imperfect, you knew that he loved the imperfection. <laughs> and the, the glancing rhyme is, is very satisfying to me. Mm. Mm. It makes subtle sounds, mm. and uh, I, I like subtlety in poems. Mm. Mm. And then finally I wanted to ask, you know, that, that sort of simple question that's so difficult so often to a answer, which is why do you write? And, um, like, you know, it, I, you've mentioned it in a way already, but you, in um, a testament, your poem, A Testimony, you talk about our only paradise is the ordinary. Um, That's what I've been saying exactly. tonight. So what, what has poetry done for you and what can it do for us? It's kept me poor. <laughs> <laughs> Got me into lots of trouble. <laughs> but uh, I consider myself well recompensed oh. by, by the experiences I've had of writing. Mm. I sometimes I find writing very hard, and I nearly drive myself crazy, revising and, and going on and on. And after the poem's published, I feel dissatisfied with it and revise it again. <laughs> and I publish a new selected poems with the revisions, <laughs> and people complain. <laughs> <laughs> but I revise it again for the next selected poems. I've published, I think, eight selected poems, all of them copiously revised. <laughs> and they say, well, which one do we trust? Which one do we read? And I say, it's always the latest one that's the best. Mm. But I think I've, I'm a good judge of my work and I I might be slow at getting it right, but when I do get it right, I, I trust that latest version. Mm. You've revised a lot for Cumulus as well, haven't yes, you? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, revising's fun. Right, yeah. <laughs> and it's possible to improve things. Huh, huh. Many people revise, but they don't let on. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. They, they keep it quiet. You know. yeah. Les Murray revises copiously. Does he? Oh, he yeah, even yeah. Re takes some of my suggestions yeah. <laughs> and puts them, puts them in. But then he says, no, 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 nothing revised. <laughs> and 
what, what I'm a, a native that? genius, you know, <laughs> untouched by by any revision. <laughs> but um, and what do, what would you, you know, what would you encourage? What what would you say if you were to encourage people to read poetry? Just, what, what will they get? From I don't it? think people need read poetry. If you if you're the sort of person who likes to read poetry, you'll find you'll come to it. Mm. And I, I like the movies too. <laughs> <laughs> I like painting. I like lots, mm. lots of music. Mm. Lots of things. Someone asked me, what's the, your favourite pop song to, today? And I said, it's impossible to say, but I like L.A. Woman, Woman by the Doors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like Sad Eyed Lady of the Lowlands by Bob Dylan. But I like all sorts of art forms. We need as much consolation as we can get, as much pleasure. In Life would be very boring if we, we didn't have art. Mm. Uh, uh, I wish you tell the government that. <laughs> <laughs> they might come good. I mean, you talk about art, you, in, in the back of Cumulus, there's, there's some of your drawings, or wonderful drawings. Well, they're drawings that I like to do. To do. Mm. I was telling you earlier, um, someone tried to get my, a book of mine published in England and it had drawings in it. And the, the editor at Faber wrote back and said, we won't take the poems, but we would like you to illustrate some books for us. <laughs> <laughs> I was all for it, but the publisher wouldn't have it. <laughs> said, don't be crazy. But I, I really love drawing. Huh. Huh. And it's done just for its own sake. I mean, I've got a few in the back of the book, but mm. there are hundreds that mm. will never be seen. Mm. You were telling me that you don't show them even. No, mm. no, just, I just like doing them. Mm. Emily Dickinson didn't publish her poems. She published half a dozen poems in her life but had 1,776 poems in the drawer, mm. all small. So it's, it's a satisfying thing to do in its own right, mm. Mm. I think. That's any, any other consolation? <laughs> any other consolation? I, I don't want to claim to be an authority on Buddhism when I'm talking about what, what uh, meditation has meant to me, but. I'm, I'm not. I'm just satisfied with Buddhism in, in some ways. I don't believe in rebirth. I find that an impossible notion. And I'll give you a reason why I don't believe in it. In Theravada countries, it's claimed that we're reborn in the next moment, straight away. But in Tibetan Buddhism, it's claimed that we're in the Bardo Thadol for 49 days. Why can't they get it right? <laughs> <laughs> that bothers me, and it also bothers me that the Buddhism is dualistic about the, toward the mind. It it claims that uh, that it, it, science has found that the mind and and the brain are the same. They they occur in the same spot in the inside our skull. Awareness is superimposed on physical condition. The, the mind and the brain are exactly the same. And they can't find a mind which is not supported by a physical entity. Mm. So uh, I find it dissatisfying that Buddhists who know so much about the mind from me meditation should be prepared to accept this act of faith which supports rebirth. Mm. Rebirth is the fundamental idea in Theravada Buddhism, you know, mm. that you, mm. you have to get off the wheel of existence because it's so dissatisfying. And uh, so I think that Buddhism is something that has to evolve. Mm. And it has evolved through history. Uh, uh, most religions are at their best with their founder. Christianity is at its high point with the founder of Christianity. 
Buddhism is at a high point in the future. It, it continues to evolve and refine itself and get more satisfying and better. And uh, I, that's my considered criticism. Mm. I, I, won't, I won't sort of no. <laughs> argue with you. Tempted though I am. Anyway. <laughs> I might be quite wrong. It's just those two things struck me mm. Mm. as... Um, Problems in Buddhism. Mm. But I still see Buddhism as the best answer to uh, existence that we have. That's been, I think the figure of the Buddha uh, is one of the high points in human consciousness. The, the figure of the Buddha sitting in meditation is one of the, is probably the highest human achievement because uh, it knows the way to salvation, which is to be carried on the winds of change. Mm to let change release us from uh, the problems of existence. Sorry, I'd do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we'll finish there. Thank you very much, Robert.